Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth, and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want, conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime, vlogs, so if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe, and if not, totally chill. We're just here today to talk a little bit of true crime, and today we are going to be talking about the case of Kasha Zawada. Now there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. On January 6, 1999, a small tailboat was sailing through the Vistula River and going through the Polish city of Krakow. It was extremely dark outside because it was nearing midnight and it was also in January, so it was the depths of winter. There was icebergs among the water, the winds were extremely high, and so this tailboat crew was moving as quick as possible to just get the job done and go back to the docking station. A little after midnight, they finished up their job, they went to the docking station, but on the way back as they were docking, they heard a loud thump hit the side of the boat and then whatever made that thump got caught into the propeller. Now, as I said, at this time, it's midnight, it's cold. These guys have been working all day long. All they want to do is just go home and sleep. So the captain just said, you know, it's fine. Let's just leave whatever's in the propeller there for now. It's dark outside. And if we try to get in the water, it's probably freezing cold. And this wasn't really uncommon because in the area, a lot of people would unfortunately just like throw their trash in the river. So sometimes Sometimes the trash would get caught in the propeller or like sometimes just excess material from other boats would get into the propeller of other boats so they just assumed it to be something like that and pushed it off to the next morning so the next morning the captain goes out there with their engineer to figure out what was tangled up in the propeller so as the engineer went down there he started looking at the propeller and kept on pulling out this very odd material it was kind of like a leatherish material but extremely pale but it wasn't thin or paper-like. It was very thick and blubbery. So the captain is looking down at the engineer who's pulling all this material up and the captain notices that on one of the pieces there's a small silver hoop attached to it. So he picks it up and he's trying to figure out what this attaches to before he later realizes that this silver hoop is actually an earring and what he's holding is a human ear. So he drops it, he backs up, and as he looks at all of the material, he starts to make out the shape of a breast, a leg, and an arm, and realizes that all of this material from the propeller was actually human skin. And so the police were immediately called over, and as they were looking at all of this skin, it looked to be the skin of a woman, and it seemed to be made into a vest. It looked like as if someone had cut the front side of a woman's body, and then cut off the back side, and then and just sewn together the two pieces to make it like a vest. But when examining all of the skin, they realized that this truly was just the skin. There was no blood, there was no organs, and it seemed like it was done with lots of precision. And so the police are baffled by this and they go and send out divers and these divers actually end up finding pieces of a buttocks and a leg laying at the bottom of the river. They give this skin to medical examiners so they could do tests on it and what they find the cutting technique of the skin was definitely used with surgical tools and it was done with lots of precision and technique you can definitely tell that this was not someone's first time doing this it just looked way too clean and prestigious in order for it to be someone's first time doing this it more just seemed like it was someone who had done this multiple times in order to perfect their technique and after the medical examiners done some tests they had concluded this was the body of 23-year-old Kasia Zawada, who had recently just went missing from her home in Krakow, Poland. Katrzyna Zawada, aka Kasia Zawada, was living in eastern Krakow with her mother and was currently a university student majoring in religion. And she was actually studying religion after previously trying out psychology and history. A lot of people who met Kasia described her to be very introverted and very quiet. She didn't really talk to, she never really went went out of her way to talk to many people. The only way she would really talk to someone is if they talked to her first, but when she was talking to people, but a lot of people who did have interactions with her described her as very easy to get along with and funny, but for the most part, Kasia just remained very mysterious. She never went to parties, she never went to school dances, never participated in any clubs or sports. She only had a small circle of friends, and other than that small circle of friends, she never really talked to anyone 
someone else. But this behavior of hers to become more introverted actually started back in 1996 when she unfortunately lost her dad and she actually witnessed her father die. Back in 1996, her and her father were out on a hiking trip, which was something that they did often. It was just bonding time for the both of them and this one time as they were hiking up a hill, her father took a wrong step and actually fell off the hill, breaking his spine and that later led to his death. And after this, she became extremely depressed because she absolutely loved her father and she also felt really bad because she wasn't able to save him even though she was there and she felt extremely guilty about it. And she also started just feeling like if she would have never went on the trip in general, then this may have never happened. So then it was following the death of her father where she started to become very shy and introverted. Kasha was also a huge Grateful Dead fan and was super into that psychedelic scene. Her friend actually went to the States and when she came back, she gifted Kasha a book that was called, quote, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe, which was basically just a book that followed like this group of young adults who take acid all across the US and goes into like their experiences, what happens to their brains. And Kasha was super into this lifestyle, very free spirited and was a frequent record shop customer at the Mainstown Square. And then on November 12th, 1998, that's when Kasha actually had scheduled an appointment with her psychiatrist, which she didn't show up to. Kasha's mom actually realized that Kasha never came home to get ready for her appointment and started to feel extremely uneasy about it. And later on that night, when Kasha still hadn't returned home, that's when her mom went to the station to report her missing. But when she went to the station, she was met with a lot of disrespect. The police didn't really take her seriously. They basically just said to her like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. She'll turn up in a couple hours. This happens all the time. And they also just told her that Kasha was 23 years old. She's technically an adult. So she technically doesn't even have to tell her mom her whereabouts. But weeks went by and there was still no sight or answer from Kasha. At this point, the police did file her missing and did open up an investigation, but they really didn't have much to go off of. They talked to Kasha's mom and Kasha's mom couldn't really figure out where Kasha could have gone. They talked to her friends and her friends didn't really know. This was also the year of 1998. And so the technology back then compared to how it is now, it was very hard to find someone if you didn't have like any concrete evidence. And at this point, Kasha's mom just felt extremely helpless. She felt like the police weren't taking her seriously. And so then that's when she went out and did her own thing. She made missing persons flyers and posted them all over the town and she hired a personal investigator. But time would go by and there was still no sight or answer from Kasha. But that was until January 6th of 1999 when a tailboat engineer would pull out human skin from a propeller that would later be tested to be Kasha's skin. So when examining Kasha's skin, they knew that whoever did this had done it before. And they also know that whoever had done this, done this with the intention to make an outfit out of Kasha's skin. This was definitely not a spare of the moment, so that's why they do believe that she was either kidnapped or lured. They also believe that she was drugged and tortured for a long period of time due to all of the bruising and cuts on her skin. And the medical examiners even believe that Kasha was probably alive during the skinning process. Police actually go to Kasha's school to ask around if they had seen sights of Kasha, but the police actually find out that Kasha, a couple weeks before her disappearance, had actually dropped out of school. And Kasha's mom was not aware about this, but when they asked Kasha's friends, they basically just said, oh yeah, Kasha. At first, she was just skipping classes randomly before she started skipping all her classes and then stopped going all together. But a lot of her friends would say that every time Kasha would skip, it was to hang out with this guy friend of hers. Now, they didn't know his name. They didn't really know what he looked like. As I said, Kasha wasn't one to give out personal information like that. And so Kasha's friends basically just knew him as a man and that's it. They said that Kasha and this guy would often skip class to go to the bars in the main town square. They would go to record shops and clothing stores. But another really odd factor about all of this is that, as I said, the couple weeks leading up to her disappearance, she had not gone to school. But when her picture was posted all over the campus, they actually got a couple reports from the 
cleaners there that said that they have seen that girl and it's because for the past couple of weeks she's been working there but she didn't introduce her name as Kasha she introduced her name as Angie but they did say that they recognized that girl and they knew that girl because they had been working with her for the past couple of weeks and some more odd factors was that a couple weeks leading up to Kasha's disappearance she had dyed her hair black and changed up her style a little bit now it was more 90s grunge her friends also said that Kasha would take frequent train rides outside of the city and more into the cottage countryside area in order to meet up with this man and the police actually did have one suspect who lived outside of the city and he did have a long history of not only harassing women but also stalking women with binoculars he also had a history of buying and wearing women's underwear and this man was even seen multiple times showing up to Kasha's grave and not only would he just show up to Kasha's grave he was seen there multiple times a day because he would light a candle there but as soon as that candle would go out he would be right there to replace it this mystery man was also seen there burying letters right next to Kasha's grave but later on when the police went to this grave they tried to look for the letters and they couldn't find any and they also staked out in front of the grave to wait and see if anybody would show up but unfortunately this man didn't so the police right now are convinced that this mystery man that Kasha was meeting up with is definitely her murderer but they just don't know who this man is and they also don't even know anything about this man that was until May of 1999 when one day the police would receive a random package and in this package was photos of a decapitated man and in a box that came with the photos was a severed head and the severed head actually had no skin on it it seemed as if the skin had been sliced off and so the police seeing this were absolutely terrified because with Cash's case they believe that whoever sent this package to them is Cash's killer because what are the odds that Kasha was skinned and this head is also skinned but ironically minutes after this package had came into the police station that's when the police would receive a phone call from a frantic elderly man saying that he believes his grandson is a murderer so this elderly man actually lived with his son and his son's son so his son and his grandson and he said that on that day he came home early from work and so he went down to the basement to start on a project but when he went down there that is when he was confronted with the sight of his son strung upside down inside of the basement and with no head immediately when he saw this he ran out of the house ran as far away from the house as possible before calling the police and he said that the only person in the house at that time was his grandson Vladimir Vladimir W was 26 years old and originally from Russia but he actually moved to Poland to live with his grandfather and his father and he also went to college ironically the same college as Kasia Vladimir lived with his grandfather and his father but Vladimir was said to not really get along with his father them two would tend to butt heads a lot not really see eye to eye but when it came to Vladimir and his grandfather they had a really strong relationship and the grandfather who was calling the police right now he tells the police that the last time he saw Vladimir's father aka his son was that morning when the two of them had breakfast together but he said that his son this morning was just a little off because when they went to breakfast he was speaking in a very low and odd tone the entire Entire time and on top of that he was also wearing this huge balaclava that covered most of his face and even throughout the entire breakfast he refused to take it off so he was just acting really weird and so the grandfather just thought that maybe he was sick and that he would just go home and sleep it off but unfortunately what really happened that morning was the grandfather was out of the house and it was just Vladimir and his father the two of them had gotten into a really bad argument with which led Vladimir to want revenge on his father. So he then lured his father to the basement where he stunned him with a stun gun. He kept on stunning him with the stun gun until he eventually fell to the floor and that's when Vladimir pulled out a knife and began to stab his father to death. Once his father was dead, that's when he strung his father's body upside down from the ceiling and cut off his head. He then drained the head and cut off 
all of the skin off of the head so he could make a human face mask and so he took the skinless head put it in a box and then he started to create this face mask of his father's face but the most disturbing part about all of this is that while he's creating this mask he gets a phone call from his grandfather because apparently the grandfather and vladimir's father were actually supposed to meet for breakfast that morning so his grandfather calls and is like hey Vladimir is your dad there um, we were supposed to meet at this one park bench because we were gonna go to breakfast together but he's not here yet and Vladimir just says oh yeah he's right here he'll be over there in about 10 minutes but as I said Vladimir's dad is dead because he is currently strung up in the basement and so what Vladimir does is he goes downstairs and he puts on the face mask that he just made of his father's face he goes upstairs grabs his father's coat his shoes and his big top hat with a huge balaclava and walked down to the park bench to meet up with his grandfather now the grandfather had really bad hearing and really bad vision so when he saw his son walk up to him to the park bench it looked like his son he didn't really think anything was too off and the fact that he was speaking in a really odd and low tone he just kind of thought that maybe it was his hearing but in reality that was not his son it was actually his grandson wearing a human face mask of his son's face and so that's when the grandfather was supposed to head off to work while vladimir went back to the house in order to decapitate his father's body but for some reason the grandfather never went to work he did come home a lot earlier than expected and that's that's when he went down in the basement he discovered the body and he ran upstairs got as far away from the house as he could and called the police as the grandfather is driving away from the house that is around the same time when vladimir i don't know for some reason he was out of the basement at the time that the grandfather went down there but vladimir did indeed go down there at one point and that's when he decapitated his father's body took pictures of it put it in the box along with the skinless head he also also put a bunch of salt inside of the box because apparently salt slows down the decomposing process so then he put a bunch of salt in there took this box and walked it down to the police station when the police received this package shortly after that's when the grandfather called in to let them know what he just saw they connect the dots pretty fast and they immediately go to Vladimir's house when the police get there they end up catching Vladimir pretty quickly because they were actually showing up at the same time Vladimir had just gotten back from going to the police station and so Vladimir was immediately arrested and he told police that the reason why he killed his father was because it was out of revenge for something that his father did but he never went into specific as to what that thing was and as for wearing his father's face out in public and with his grandfather Vladimir basically just said that that was a thing he did to see if he could just get away with it which technically he did and so the police are convinced that this point that this is Kasha's killer but unfortunately this was not Kasha's killer this was just another person in the neighborhood that had an obsession with skin and skinning people he had a bunch of alibis that didn't really line up with the timeline of Kasha and although they did go to the same colleges a lot of Kasha's friends said that Kasha would frequently skip class in order to hang out with this mystery guy but surprisingly Vladimir had a really good attempt and so there were a lot of times where he would be in class and it would be confirmed by teachers and other students at the same exact time that Kasha wasn't in class. So it wouldn't make sense for Kasha to skip class if Vladimir was currently in class. And there were also a bunch of other factors that ruled him out. So they just dismissed him and arrested him for the murder of his father, to which he actually got life in prison. And after five years of serving it, he went back home to Russia to live out the rest of his life sentence. So the police at this point feel very hopeless because they thought that they had the killer but turns out it was just another dead end. And so years went by and into the early 2000s with the rise of new technology, they
they were able to figure out a little bit more about Kasha and what might have happened to her. It was determined that that skin had been in the water for weeks upon it being found. They noticed that on Kasha's body, she had some vegetation all over her skin that was only frequent in the outside cities. They also concluded by the bruising on her skin that whoever had done this to her may have trained in some sort of martial arts. And then in 2017, nearly 20 years later, Kasha's case finally has a big break. And that is when an anonymous letter gets sent into the police from a guy who basically is saying that he believes his friend, who was 52-year-old Robert Yanvitsky, is the murderer of Kasha. And so the police take this with a grain of salt. They don't really think much of it, but they do go to the home to ask Robert a couple of questions. And when they show up to the home, Robert is immediately very defensive. Like the police aren't being aggressive or anything towards him. They're basically just asking him like, oh, hey, we have a couple of questions about this girl named Kasha. Do you know her? And instead of being very confused or asking who she was and what this was about, he became very defensive and he said, I don't know who Kasha is. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you guys are here. And eventually just slammed the door on the police, which was a very, very suspicious thing. So then that's when the police leave and they start looking more into Robert's past. In 2017, Robert was currently living in Krakow with his mother. His dad was actually a poet that left his mother when he was a child for another woman. His family was extremely religious growing up, although they were very physically and emotionally abusive. And since Robert was an only child, all of the anger that the parents felt just unfortunately fell onto him. And when the police were looking into his criminal record, surprisingly, he didn't really have much, only two assaults from the 90s, but both times he was the victim. And after these two assaults, that is when Robert decided to pick up martial arts as a way to defend himself. He later joined the military and after serving a while there, he came home, he got a job at a morgue where his job was to dissect corpses. He also went to school at the Krakow Zoology Institute where he learned about animal skins and how animal skin is prepared for taxidermy. So he was taught everything there is to know about skinning an animal, how to skin an animal, how to dispose of the organs and the bones, but Robert was actually kicked out of this school shortly after being there after simply just killing all of the rabbits. And when his superiors had asked Robert, why did you do that? Like, why did you just ruthlessly kill all of the rabbits? And Robert said that he didn't know why he did that. He said that he just had the thought of doing it. And then the next thing you know, it was just already done. A lot of people at his job would describe Robert to be a very creepy and off guy. He would frequently talk about women very oddly and said that he only dated women that wore French underwear. And he also only dated women that were submissive and obedient to him. And you'll never believe this, but turns out Robert was the same guy from back in the 90s who kept on going to Cash's grave to bury letters and stuff like that. Turns out Robert, that was the same guy that kept on going to her grave. He just realized one day that the police were staking out in front of it. So after that, he just stopped going altogether. And apparently back in the 90s, there were actual reports made by Robert's neighbors who told the police that they believe Robert was the killer. There were all of these neighbors basically saying that Robert was a really off-putting and weird guy and the way that he spoke about women was extremely disgusting and it was even creepier that his job was dissecting corpses and so then that's when the neighbors were like well if his job is dissecting corpses and he also goes to the zoology institute where he learns about taxidermy it would make sense that he committed this crime but weirdly these reports were never looked into. So the police go to the home of Robert once again, but now with a search warrant. And when they get in there, they find two really big things. They find blood in the bathroom to which even after 20 years later, it was identified to be Kasha's blood. And then on top of that, they also found Robert's diary to which he kept a diary since the 90s. And in this diary, it detailed multiple stalking and harassment of women. It would just go in into very specific detail about the women he was harassing and stalking, where they lived, what their routine was like. But out of 
all of the entries, there was only one woman that he had actually murdered, and that woman's name was Kasha Zawada. And they found this journal entry from 1998 that went into very gruesome detail about the manipulation, the torture, the skinning, and the murder of Kasha. So once the police read this, they immediately arrest Robert, and weirdly enough, Robert tries to say that he didn't do it and he tries to actually say that someone broke into his house like the real murderer broke into his house and planted that journal there to make him look bad but this theory was completely wiped out the window because there were a lot of things in this journal that quite literally lined up exactly with robert's life and in the journal robert goes into detail about how he met kasha i said that kasha frequented at record shops around this one place called the main towns square so robert actually worked at a clothing store in that town square and one day Kasha walked into the store and him and her started talking. Kasha and him were super into psychedelics and the Grateful Dead and so that's something that they bonded over and as time went on that is when Kasha would grow a bigger and bigger crush over Robert. She even tried to change herself in order for Robert to like her more like for example Robert had told her that he preferred girls with black hair so she she went ahead and dyed her hair. The clothing store that Robert worked at was more of like a 90s grunge store, so then that's when Kasha started also wearing 90s grunge clothing. And he also made Kasha lose a lot of weight because he told Kasha that he liked his girls thinner, but in reality, he was actually making Kasha lose weight because I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Silence of the Lambs, but in the movie Silence of the Lambs, it's basically about a murderer who kidnaps and skins women, but before he actually skins the women, he then makes the women lose weight, and so the skin is a lot more pliable and easier to work with during the skinning process, and that's basically what Robert was doing to Kasha because he had plans on skinning her. On the day that Kasha Kasha went missing. Up until that point, the two of them had been basically hanging out every single day. I mean, Kasha dropped out of school just to hang out with him all the time. And so the day before Kasha went missing, that's when Robert had suggested that him and Kasha go to this very romantic cottage up in the mountains. I'm sorry if you're watching the visual and you just saw me hella orange right now. The sun is starting to go down, so the lighting just got really weird. I fixed it. Sorry about that. So Kasha and ended up going to this cottage with Robert in the woods, but when they got to this cottage, that's when Robert had lured Kasha down to the basement. He then abused her, tortured her, and skinned her while she was going in and out of consciousness. He was an expert at skinning and the treatment of wounded skin due to his job and his education. He used his surgical equipment that he usually uses at his job in order to do it, but in his journal, he says that he tried tried to make a face mask out of her, but unfortunately he couldn't wear it because her head was smaller than his, and so then that's when he tried to make a vest, but still her body was way smaller than his body, so eventually he just got frustrated and threw all of the scraps into the river, and Cash's skin wouldn't even be found until a couple weeks later by a tailboat crew engineer. Robert also went to church. He went to church every Sunday and Wednesday, and always sat front row and it was actually said that Robert had actually confessed to this murder to a monk but that monk at the time was very old and very sick and so he ended up passing away just a couple days after Robert told him so unfortunately this monk had died with Robert's secret and although Robert was pleading not guilty to the very end that is when the court obviously found him very guilty of this crime and that's when he was sentenced to life in prison with no possible possibility of parole. And surprisingly, after his sentencing, a lot of people came forward to say that they believe Robert didn't do this. As Robert was awaiting trial, he was meeting frequently with a psychiatrist, and this psychiatrist had diagnosed him with schizophrenia. And so a lot of people believe that maybe the police tried to force Robert into a confession and use his schizophrenia against him just so they could close this case. Even Robert's own psychiatrist had even 
come out and said that she doesn't believe Robert is the murderer. There's a lot of people who also believe that that letter that came into the police, the anonymous letter, basically pointing Robert to the crime, they believe that whoever sent that letter was the killer, but they were just putting all the blame onto Robert. But all of these claims were literally thrown out the window because they make no sense, and it's so obvious that Robert did this crime. Tasha went missing in Krakow, and Robert lived in Krakow. He had a whole entire diary that detailed Kasia's murder, torture, and skinning, as well as the harassment and stalking of many, many other women. Her literal DNA was found in the house, and he was trained in martial arts, and he also had a job that involved him to dissect corpses and had lots of experience in skinning. The person who actually sent this anonymous letter in came out, and it was actually a friend of Robert's who had met Robert through a bunch of gardening clubs that they were in. This friend also ironically had a reptile store in the main town square where Robert worked at and this friend would go on to say that Robert would often skin things in his own time and he even had a whole collection of many reptiles that he had skinned such as snakes, lizards, alligators. But this friend also described Robert as quote an alcoholic and a sadist who enjoys beating women. And as for today Robert is still in prison living out his life sentence and is never going to be let out again so he will most likely deservingly so die in prison and yeah that is the end of today's case if you guys found this case interesting make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and also in the comments below let me know what you think about the case do you think robert is actually the killer do you think he's not the killer and also there's so many unanswered questions about this case as to how robert was never found in the past. He does have a long history of harassing and stalking women, but weirdly, he just never got caught. And also, as I said in the way, way beginning, Robert had a thing for buying and wearing women's underwear. And so when I was learning about this case, a lot of men who are serial killers and also have a connection to wearing women's clothing also love to harass and stalk women because they want to become a woman. And so that's kind of what I felt with Robert's case. Maybe since he wore women's underwear, it made him feel more like a woman and that's why he harassed and stalked them because he wanted to be them. And when he met Kasha, he planned on making her skin into a human vest so that he could wear her and then become a woman. But when that didn't work out, he got frustrated and threw everything into a river. And I also think it's crazy how he got caught 20 years later. Like, he probably thought that he was gonna successfully get away with it. He probably thought that he was gonna live out the rest of his life, not even get any consequences for it. And I just think it's crazy that even after 20 years, he was still arrested for his crimes and he is going to die in prison. But yes, I would love to hear all of your guys' thoughts in the comments below. And yeah, that is all for me. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to stay hydrated, get outside today, get some fresh air. And as always, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I will see you guys next week.